Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and in this uh, video, I'm going to talk about uh, some work that uh, James Hansen has just uh, uh, published on his uh, website. It's called Reflections on Timescales and Butterflies. It's mostly on climate change, um, you know, what's happening, you know, what the, what's going on with global temperatures. Um, and he has been tracking following butterflies, you know, the disappearance of butterflies, the, the, the um, annual migration. Uh, they leave the States and they go down to Mexico in winter and then come back and the numbers are fewer and fewer. But let's uh, talk about the, uh, the global uh, temperatures, air temperatures, sea surface temperatures, etc. The rates of warming, the, the vanished uh, El Nino or ENSO, um, the La Nina or, or El Nino component uh, being replaced by uh, neutral to possibly La Nina. So global average temperatures have hit, you know, about 1.6 degrees Celsius and uh, they may back off a little bit down to 1.4, but I'm not going to hold my breath on that. It may not uh, happen. But anyway, let's have a look at the uh, at the data here. So one of the things in the last video that I talked about is the um, modeling of of tropical storms, uh, namely hurricanes, as a Carnot heat engine, where you've got the hot temperature being the sea surface temperature and the cool temperature being the temperature of the tropopause. Well, over the last century, the sea surface temperatures have increased about a degree Celsius, more so in the tropics, but more noted, more noted um, and not mentioned by anybody else is the tropopause temperatures seem to have declined by anywhere from two to four degrees since about 1980 or so. So that would be in the last uh, 40 to 50 years, basically. And if you look at uh, storms, thunderstorms, etc., as Carnot heat engines, and there's going to be more intensity in them. And the largest factor is actually the decline in the tropopause temperature. Um, it's also, they're also strengthened by the rise in the sea surface temperature, but it looks like the larger effect to me is, is a decline in the tropopause. So that's a very interesting finding and, um, you know, that could partially explain why we're setting record global, uh, temperatures and, and well, it could explain why we're setting, uh, you know, record levels of extreme weather events around the planet. And uh, no place is immune from these extreme weather events. Uh, Toronto, um, where near where I grew up, um, it uh, was hit with um, massive uh, thunderstorms, three and three major thunderstorms in the space of about four or five hours, and there was about four inches of rain. An entire month's worth of rain fell in those three or four hours, and that caused tremendous amounts of uh, flooding throughout uh, Toronto and uh, damage to roads, golf courses, uh, you know, structures, etc. So extreme weather events are continuing. You know, as you know, much of the world is experiencing heat waves. Okay, so to find uh, Hanson stuff, if you just Google uh, James Hansen, Columbia University, this is a link he just posted this article on a few days ago on July 12th, Reflections on Timescales and Butterflies. And that's the topic. So this is the key graph. Um, this is global temperature relative to an 1880 to 1920 baseline, and that's the Jess Goddard Institute of Space Science baseline. This was... Uh, um, this is where we're at. This is 2023 versus other El Nino origin years. And this is El Nino, uh, you know, peak years. Uh, you can see, you know, going back. Well, this is a record over the, here's where we are right now in 2024. Here's where we were in 2023. So this is a 2023 temperatures. And you can see that the, this is a record high before 2023 the gray envelope here and we're well above it and you could for how long well you can count back uh i count 13 months so basically for the last 13 months we've been in record territory notice that the largest record gap 
Um, this, the distance between the red curve and the top of the envelope is the largest in the summer months of last year, and it's declined significantly um, throughout the winter months, and that indicates that the El Nino that we've just had and are coming out of was not very strong. So here we back, are back into the summer months. So we're likely to continue for a few more months and maybe by September, you know, it'll be interesting to see if we can clear this peak. Um, this is uh, 1.6 Celsius. You know, we may drop off to 1.4, something about that level here, but I doubt it. I think we're gonna be closer to 1.6. You know, we may cross the gray curve and break out of this, uh, you know, multi-month uh, record temperature. 2015 uh, tracked in the green line and it set the record temperatures in these uh, winter months that were higher, just higher than now. This is 1997, which was also a strong El Nino. So these were strong El Nino years. Um, so, you know, the El Nino has left us and I'll show you some images showing the progression and how we know that. Okay, so Breathless reporting on when the present global heat anomaly will begin to fall is understandable given heat suffering around the world. <clears throat> but the fundamental issues are in question and we need to look at the time scales to undergo the ongoing climate change and actions. So June, as I mentioned, was the 13th consecutive record monthly global temperature. Okay, so that's the red line here. And the changing gap uh, between the red line and prior records is revealing. So the gap smallest in the Northern Hemisphere winter, largest in the Northern Hemisphere summers. Um, so basically, you know, the El Nino that we're coming out of was not that strong or the gap would have been much, much higher. Okay, uh, the gap was actually quite small here. Okay, um, so this is, uh, so El Nino gives global temperature the biggest kick in the Northern Hemisphere winter. Um, that's consistent with direct evidence that the recent El Nino is far from a super El Nino. Okay, so it was a modest El Nino. Now here is the uh, data um, of the global temperature relative to the 1880 to 1920 based on the GIS analysis. So the green line is the best linear fit from 1970 to 2010. It's 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. Okay, that's the slope of the green curve. This is the trajectory that we've been on, which is from, from uh, 2010 uh, to present, which is 0 0.32 degrees Celsius per decade. And this was predicted long in advance by Hansen. He said that the rate would go up 50 to 100 percent, 50 percent would be 0 0.27, and uh, 100 percent would be 0 0.36. So we're closer to the upper range of that prediction. So that was a very accurate prediction. Now we can look at daily surface air temperature, and you can see that it's tapering off a little bit. This is from the University of Maine. Um, it's from the Climate Reanalyzer data set. So let's have a look. There's a few more graphs here. Um, this is uh, daily global surface air temperature. This is daily surface air temperature in the tropics, okay, uh, between 23.5 south and 23.5 latitude north. Um, so it's been very hot in the tropics and that's tapering down a little bit as the El Nino is leaving us. And this is in from 60 south to 60 north. Um, you know, still in, in record territory for sea surface temperature. And this is the zonal mean sea surface temperature relative to a more recent baseline, 1951 to 1980. And you can see where the extreme warmth is. Mid-latitude, about 45 degrees north, also in the tropics. And uh, also, you know, there's some warming too, about minus 45 degrees north, but mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. And Hansen has, of course, attributed this to the reduction of aerosols from ships. And uh, previously, it was the reduction of aerosols, namely sulfur dioxide, from, uh, from industry in China and Europe, but mostly in China. 
Okay, uh, he also talk, shows the butterfly. This is the total area of all colonies of butterflies in hectares. These are, this is by the overwintering monarch butterflies down in Mexico when they hibernate. So it's very, very small amounts here. Uh, you know, the, down, the trend has been down. Of course, they're important pollinators. Okay, so I'm sure that will be in his book and he talks about it. So where is the data? coming from. Let, let's just have a quick look at Climate Reanalyzer because there's loads of data um, on Climate Reanalyzer. So we can look at today's weather maps and get a good feel for many different parameters. So this is a two meter temperature anomaly and you can see uh, you know where, where the temperature is extremely warm over, over uh, southern Europe, you know Italy, down in this region here you know, wide, wide uh, spanning, uh, you know, heat. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, also in, uh, this is in Antarctica. And this is a polar view. So you can see it, it's, it's it, you, you can see where the heat is uh, concentrated. Okay, so that's the two, that's the anomaly. Um, there's lots of other data here. Um, you know, you can, there, there's lots of good data. Let's go back to the two meter anomaly. And I like the view of the uh, or here, of, of the planet, the whole view of the planet. So you can see where, where the heat is concentrated. You know, lots of uh, dynamic disruption of temperatures, huge temperature contrast. So generating very high winds over Antarctica. We've had a uh, sudden stratospheric warming down there. I'll probably look at that in a separate video. So let's have a look at some of the other data. So we've got um, daily surface air temperature. Hansen is showing this and there's lots of data here. You can scroll and look at the average temperature, the climatology, the anomaly um, for each different year. Like it gives the, the uh, information on the data sets going all the way back. And you can also look at just the northern hemisphere. So uh, setting record temperatures. You can look at the southern hemisphere, sort of a mixed bag, as I showed you. Uh, the Arctic, uh, you know, and Antarctic, and you can also look at the uh, tr lot of lot of fluctuation there. There's there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And then the tropics, we've had record warm temperatures, and it's uh, it's, it's no longer it's being beat by this curve here, which was 2023. Okay, so there's lots of good data there. Um, we can also look at the daily uh, sea surface temperature, um, the world. Uh, you can look at the North Atlantic and see how that things are varied. Um, this is the sea surface temperature anomaly. Uh, this is the sea surface temperature. Um, and you can look at the anomaly and you can see, look at this tremendous uh, heat here. Okay, all in this region. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff and it's very important to keep an eye on what's going on there because, uh, you know, we're concerned about the AMOC uh, slowing and shutting down even. Okay, and, and uh, the map uh, animations, I'll just look at this too. So let's have a look at the sea surface temperature anomaly for the world. Um, and uh, let's have a look at uh, year to date. Okay, and let's just play the thing. Okay, and have a look. So what we can see is, okay, so we've got, uh, this is Monday, January 1st. This is sea surface temperature anomaly relative to a, a recent baseline. The climatology is 1971 to 2000, and you can see the indication of the El Nino, and it, but it's not a very strong El Nino, okay? So now we're cycling through the dates here. Here's the date changing, so one image per day. Um, and you can see actually in real time, you can see the temperature here actually uh, decreasing. You know, you can actually see it happening day to day. There's a lot of uh, mixing of the ocean water um, and so you can actually, 
you know, clearly the water can't move that much from day to day uh, in the hor in, in along, along in this on the surface but there can be mixing and upwelling from below. So you can see a significant cooling of this feature, which is indicative of the, uh, you know, the El Nino weakening. So we're into, um, into February, coming into March, and you can see a further um, weakening. So let's just kind of look at what's happening. Uh, you know, other things to notice, lots of very, very warm temperatures here um in the uh atlantic okay now you can see this this is almost fading it's actually cooler there's a cool anomaly there um okay so we're into the uh march towards the end of march um so you can see it's interesting that you can see so much day-to-day uh, -day temperature from ocean mixing Look at this cold pool here, kind of shooting up, cutting into it. And there's another one over here. So probably join. So we're into April, uh, mid-April here. And now a cold pool right across here. So this is pretty much going into the neutral state. Okay, there's some cold water developing here. Uh, and now you can see a definite cooler pool here as we come into May. Okay. And this is probably, this is fairly well established. Cool right at the equator. Um, a bit warmer uh, as you go away from the equator. But basically we're in the, the neutral state. So we're coming up to the end of May. Let's just continue. Okay, you can see this kind of wave, wave action happening here. Okay, we're into early June. There's a lot of interesting uh, stuff going on as well. Uh, you know, probably related to what the atmosphere is doing, the jet streams, etc. Now we're into June. Um, June, end of June. Okay, so we're definitely out of the El Nino. Um, the question is, is will it stay in a neutral state? Will it go over to a La Nina? And, uh, you know, according to Hansen, global temperatures might back off to, we've been at 1.6 for, you know, over a year, basically. And, uh, you know, we could back off. So this is mid-June and then it starts again. Okay, so this is actually quite uh, useful information. We can also look at the two meter, uh, temperature anomalies um, and see how th they're changing over time and so on. So there's loads of data on climate reanalyzers. So if you if you haven't used climate reanalyzer lately, you know, open it up and uh, go through and have a look at everything. Um, I find, you know, there's a lot of really good data there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, used uh, by Hansen quite a bit, especially in his most uh, recent letter. Okay, so the bottom line is, you know, we've, we've been in record territory for 13 months. It's probably going to continue. Um, this is June. This is July. Okay, uh, so January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Okay, so we're definitely setting record temperatures July into August. September is a big question mark. You know, does this curve go up enough to to surpass the record high, the previous record high, which is about, you know, that I, if I'm reading that correctly, that's 1.6. It's about 1.7 almost. Okay, in September. If we can climb up and pass that, then we'll probably stay higher for, for longer. Uh, but the El Nino has vanished. It's neutral. If it goes to a um, La Nina, the cooling phase, it's probably going to slice through this peak and, you know, the record, the long record string will be broken. So the next few months uh, will be very interesting to determine uh, what's going to happen.
Okay, well, thank you for listening. Please consider going to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and donating to my PayPal to support my research and videos. Thanks again, and bye for now.